Hey y'all, this is Tommy. I just wanted to take this moment before uh, we get into the pod to, uh, I guess, just inform and let everybody know. Um, I did this podcast while I was on uh, my, I guess you say, mini vacation in uh, New York City, which was an incredibly good time. I got into a lot of personal stuff in this episode, a lot of deep stuff, and while editing this uh, episode, I unfortunately was informed of the loss of our family dog, Mr. Toby, aka Poots Magoo. And I just wanted to take this opening to, as corny as it may be, uh, shout out my dog and dedicate this episode to him because that little mutt came into my life uh, probably at the darkest point in my life after I dropped out of uh, college uh, I had my second DWI and all this other stuff and really I guess it's kind of ironic because a lot of this stuff that I touch on in this uh, episode I never really had anybody I could really talk to about it. There's like a handful of people, but you know, not really that deep letting myself go. And it was my dog Toby, who usually was there when I was alone and crying and truly feeling alone. So I am internally grateful for that little mutt and the time that we got to spend with each other. And like I said, it's ironic that I recorded this episode like this, so, uh, and then after for this to happen. So you may think it's corny, you may think it's a little crazy, but I do dedicate this episode to probably one of the best friends I've ever had. So, Toby, uh, <laughs> this one's for you, little buddy. That's right, you are now listening to Tommy Tom's One Mic. Warning, this podcast contains explicit language, triggering or sensitive topics, and controversial discussions. Thank you so much for tuning in to Tommy Tom's One Mic. I'm Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, flip personality, you know it's I. You never see my kind, never seen a fucking sliver or a slice. I'm the butcher, choice cuts, no I'm nice. You got beef? I got waggle with a knife. Now I'm gonna be wrapping up bodies up at night. Like Ray Charles, y'all yeah, know I'm out of sight. Now I'm gonna be slaying niggas cause you know I love the life. Yo, you gotta read between the lines. I'm only gonna be moving when I'm read through all the signs. Johnny Mnemonic, I got an upgrade in mind. This is for the rebels and the revolutionary minds. Cybernetic linguistics, you know I'm on my mind. Prototype the new dimension, man, that shit is mine. Future is creation and creation is sublime. Make your own legend, only happens with time. Let's hit the mic. Hey guys, welcome back once again to Tommy Tom and One Mic. And today, uh, I guess you can say I am actually doing what the show is called. Because it's just me and this one mic. Um, if you've been following my social media, you would know that I decided to take a trip to the city this past weekend. Take a little, I guess, personal vacay. You know, recharge the old batteries and everything. And uh, I have to admit, it was uh, probably one of the best decisions I made in a while. Um, I just really got to chill out and have a little more fun. So, you know, I have been saying to myself that uh, if I could get to 20, 25 episodes of this, I would probably do a kind of solo show, uh, kind of thank you update show uh just to show my appreciate uh, my appreciation for uh, everyone who actually follows and listens to this podcast, and uh, just to give a, I guess, a personal update on things that I'm working on, and maybe also, I guess, uh, how I've been feeling. Um, coming to the city uh, was refreshing. It's been a while since I've been able to just kind of hang out in the city and it not feel, I guess, weird. I mean, it's still a little weird, but it's not 
like it was. So it was good to get back out here, um, reconnect with uh, some friends that uh, some I haven't seen since 2019 because, you know, 2020 happened. But I am, I am humbled and have come to uh, a many uh, realizations, I guess you could say. So uh, in this episode, you know, just as a fair warning, yeah, you're going to get some updates, but probably most of this show is just me kind of reflecting on a lot of things, you know, uh, I'm 33, <laughs> not a young man anymore, and I'm sure there's those that are listening to this and be like, that's not that old, but I've had to do a lot of growing up, and I'll be honest, uh, probably some of the things I'll talk about this episode, uh, probably after the break will be very personal, uh, very real, and will probably make some people uncomfortable. Uh, so I apologize for that. Um, by no means, though, I go about my life thinking I'm better than anybody. Um, but I do understand that we all need a little humbling in our lives. Uh, I guess if I was supposed to start this off, I guess the big thing I realized uh, and the thing I got to be humble about is, I guess, my view of New York comics in the past when I first started. Um, there's usually um, groups and crews of people who, you know, frequent that mic. So they build these relationships and these bonds and these friendships. And... You know, not being from the city and coming down, there was always this kind of feeling of, uh, I guess, I wasn't invited to the cool kids table, which is all right. But, you know, um, it probably hampered my view of things. And that's my own fault, you know. Um, I'm well aware of all my faults, and one of my biggest one is my lack of self-confidence, you know. Uh, which people might find crazy given that I've been doing stand-up, but it's true. I <laughs> I have almost zero self-confidence when it comes to talking and meeting new people. Um, I guess a great example of this would be uh, uh, Gail Donnelly and Antique Mascara, which I believe in their episodes I stated I was very intimidated and scared to reach out to them to perform um, for my shows that I do and that's never changed i have always scared and intimidated to reach out and talk to people you know I went to a mic last night oh really I went to a show uh, Naomi shout out to Naomi Eden uh, it was her first produced show the borderline uh, comedy show up here in Astoria Queens and I'm real glad that I went. There's just this feeling in a comedy show and in the open mic afterwards where, I don't know, you can just be you and you don't have to really think about it or care. And if that's a feeling, to be honest, I don't think I've felt like since probably even a little before the pandemic because... I did become very jaded, you know, I wanted to make friends and shit like that. And when I found, you know, some local mics around me, I just kind of turned to that to try and build something there. And look, I'll be honest, that failed fucking miserably, you know. Um, I don't know what it is or why people think I'm some arrogant prick. Or that I just think about myself. But I, I'm i surprised and hurt, I guess you could say, by the number of performers I've put on those shows that pretty much have ghosted me and treat me like that one night stand they infinitely regret. And all I guess I really want to know is why, <laughs> you know? Um, that's really it, you know? Uh, it kind of sucks that you continue to try and reach out to try and talk and then you find out oh you they've already unfriended or unfollowed you and stuff 
um, and most of the stuff that they told you was bullshit, you know, and who knows, maybe that's how they feel about me and the shows, you know, I don't pretend to be a professional uh, producer of shows, I learned on the fly, you know, I can tell you the first show I did uh, in 2020 during the pandemic, I wasn't expecting <laughs> 150 plus people to show up, uh, you know, the middle of nowhere for this show. So, um, that's my bad. And I know that was, uh, kind of the beginning of the downfall of, I guess, my relationships with, uh, a lot of the comics. I kind of started, um, the LL showcase, Look, Laugh, Listen with, and took a lot of guilt for that. But at the same time, um, if we're fair and honest, some of these people probably need to grow the fuck up, <laughs> you know, and maybe that just adds to me looking like more of a dick in their eyes just for saying that, but I mean, <laughs> can you really get mad at somebody when you yourself don't come prepared for a show as well? I mean, seriously, <laughs> like... Maybe I should have said something or spoke up more. Like I said, that's uh, my fault with my low self-confidence. You know, I don't think I'm, I guess, respected in the comedy world. So I don't try and uh, overstep, you know. I think everyone's going to find their own way. And even if I see something that I don't think is a good idea, but I just let it go. And then, you know, that is my fault. And... Look, I may be 33, but I'm still learning. I'm still growing. And, you know, <laughs> I apologize for these failures at shows, you know. But at the same time, I'm also kind of sick of being made out to be a villain, you know. Like I said, my issue with, I guess, the New York comedy scene was that it seemed very fraternity, like group base and I couldn't be a part of that and it's no fault of their own um, it's just the bottom line I don't live in the city I can't come out here every weekend financially and physically that it's it's tough you know I have wonderful friends out here that have let me slept sleep on their couch and stuff like that but we're getting older and their lives are changing and I I feel guilty. There's significant others that I also have to be considerate about, and it, that's my thing. You know, I rather <laughs> no one being considerate than taking advantage of something. You know, and I tried. You know, I tried to make these uh, bonds back home, but coming down to the city, there's just a different type of warmth I felt that honestly I haven't felt back home and I guess a smile that I haven't had in a while either you know I've had a lot of issues uh, back home with people I have would consider family essentially you know um, and a lot of that is tied to my depression and just that feeling that I don't matter to anybody, even though I know that's bullshit. I mean, all you have to do is listen to the two episodes with my parents to know uh, for me to say that nobody cares about me is a huge insult to them. Um, but I think it's a, it's not so much a literal statement, it's just this feeling. And I think most of us have that feeling where we think, Jesus, <laughs> I don't mean shit to this person or this person and it hurts and I know for the course of my entire life I've definitely made people feel that way and that's why I can't take it personal because I know there's people out there who definitely feel the same way I do and I don't hold it against them if they don't want to talk to me or, or forgive me for certain things you know the only thing I can hope is that uh, they can have the maturity to 
I guess see their own their own contribution to I guess to be blunt things going to shit you know uh, that's that's all I can ask because I constantly think about that all the time you know uh, because it's not other people really making me the villain I realize it's me myself in my head making myself the villain this trip to the city meant so much to me you know I really just kind of hung out didn't really do much I mean instead of going to a mic I believe I slept in but um, after Naomi show they had an open mic and I just decided to stay there and I was instantly um, overjoyed that I did because I guess like I had been posting and talking about it was good to get back to basics you know to kind of refine that love for what I'm doing you know um, I'm pretty open in saying that uh, stand up and now this podcast is really my main focus is in life because I've wasted so many years of my life uh, just doing bullshit and to be honest trying to appease and make not necessarily the wrong people but making certain people happy and neglecting the ones I probably should focus more on like my parents you know <laughs> and it's crazy it's it's been a crazy four days, which it doesn't seem long, but, you know, things really hit. I guess I, I go back to the conversation I had with Keenan during our three-hour episode that I had to cut down for an hour. Could have shared all that, but um, there was some personal talk about people and stuff that I just didn't want to put out. Not because I was scared of it, but more so, I guess, more so protecting Keenan. <laughs> Um, because that's a good dude, and I don't want people to look at him badly because he's so, I don't want to say loyal, but he's just such a good friend to me that he'll always back me up and try and build me up. So I'm internally grateful for him for doing so. Um, for the second half of this, I am going to talk about some personal stuff because. Uh, like I said, I am sick of being made out to be a villain, and I think some people need to hear some shit, <laughs> uh, to realize, and, you know, I won't use names, but I'm sure, because I know who listens to this podcast and don't, you know, uh, they're not gonna hear it, but people that know them will probably hear it, and know who I'm talking about, hey, fuck it, you know, uh, I've been pushing this thing about being real and I realize I'm still not being real. You know, I'm still holding back when I do these uh, podcast episodes that there's still something holding me back. And it's because I haven't addressed so much. And to be honest, the thing I want most from people is to be real. And I can't ask that to people if I'm not being real. Um, I guess a good example of this, um, I don't know if it's a good example, it's a pretty harsh one, but um, I guess going back to like in high school, the girl that took the V card, you know, um, we dated six days and she broke up with me and I found out that she was telling her friends that um, I pretty much used her for sex, that was the story she put out there. Now I'm lucky that even her friends didn't really believe that statement about me. But the fact that she said it and made it seem like she believed it, it was something probably even to this day that affects me and my relationships with women. You know, I, I guess in that statement it made me feel like I'm not worthy or worth uh, someone being with. And it's a thing that it stuck with. Even though, deep down, I knew it was bullshit. And I knew what the real reason was. You know, and that was when I was 16. And you fast forward to me being 32. And 
this thing called the Black Lives Matter movement started, right? <laughs> and I kind of had it avoided for a while um, saying anything uh, just because it was an awkward position for me. Uh, being adopted, you know, I've received so much hate and racism from both sides. You know, I joke on stage that to my white friends, I'm just the token black friend. And to all the minorities, I was just an Uncle Tom in their eyes, you know. I never belonged or fit with anybody. And it reflects, you know. So I, I wasn't going to say anything, but um, just from listening to others on podcasts and stuff talk about it, I realized I, I had somewhat of an obligation given that I am that person that exists in that middle ground where I can understand. I mean, I grew up uh, unknowingly in a conservative household, you know, and that's probably something I appreciate most about my parents is that uh, politics and other shit never really got brought into the house. You know, I never knew my parents were Republican, you know, <laughs> until later on in life. And it doesn't change how I, my love for them or how I feel about them. And just put a post and I just talked about those relationships and like, am I supposed to stop loving my dad because he's Republican? My friend, because he's a cop and stuff like that. I can see both sides. And so I had an obligation. I did mention, you know, growing up and hearing uh, these two girls talk about how their dads would have killed them if they had a black boyfriend. And they did it very nonchalantly, not really thinking. And I don't think either of them realized that I heard that and I got it. And it was always in the back of my mind. And one of those girls was the one that took the V card. And so I was very aware that when her dad came home, the one time I hung out at her house, that it was just a look, you know, the dad look of when you meet your daughter's boyfriend, you know, those I get, this one was, this one was different and I knew it. So 16 years later, Black Lives Movement happens, I make this post, and sure enough, she messages me and apologizes and admits that her dad had a hand in her uh, breaking up with me. And I'd be lying to say uh, that didn't hurt knowing. Um, but at the same time, it was a relief to finally know the truth, to for her to finally be real. I have no ill will or hate towards her, or because that's all I want. I want her to be honest about it. Kind of all I want from anybody. And I want the truth, not just this um, elementary little bullshit excuses, you know? And look, I'll be upfront. I don't blame them. You know, in maybe five years, I'm still figuring shit out. And I don't even like referring to myself as a comic. You know, I do kind of by default, but I always feel guilty because I don't think I've earned that title, you know. And my big thing was that I need to make five years. And then this is going to be the turning point in my life that I need to make this decision. And the difference between this and everything else that I've done in the past is that I'm being patient with it, all right? Um, this book published, you know, and that's, that's all anybody from the hometown likes to bring up. They like to bring up this fucking book. <laughs> all I'm trying to do and all I ever wanted to do was to just be me, to be Tom. And I'm trying that now. And I'd be lying if I haven't slipped. You know, I'm not perfect. But, you know, the old cliche, nobody's perfect. 
I'm just working on it. So it's it's been a journey, you know. Um, and this is something uh, last night I had a real deep talk, <laughs> real uh, deep thought about. I don't want to make this a rant or bashing on people. I just want this to be a kind of understanding with some. And I apologize to those who are listening to this and have no fucking clue what I'm talking about, you know. Because um, I'll keep it 100, this, this podcast is probably more so for me than anybody. Because you'll hear comics talk about how stand-up is their therapy. And there is nothing truer. The stand-up and doing this podcast is my therapy. The reason I have guests is because I don't think I can do these solo shows all the time. But I wanted to do it for this one because of just being in probably the best headspace I've been in a very long time. And just coming to the realization that as I go home, I need to change things in my life so that I continue to get better. And that's going to hurt and offend uh probably a number of people and admittedly I'm a coward and probably face to face I wouldn't be able to say the things I'm saying now without being a to be politically incorrect a blithering uh, pussy <laughs> of just crying and snot and not being able to contain myself and knowing that I know I'd hold back and I wouldn't say everything that I should say so once again i apologize if you are here and you're like jesus i thought this was supposed to be a comedy uh <laughs> podcast uh to be honest it's not <laughs> i talk to other comics and uh musicians but uh, i'll let you guys uh behind the curtain i've the most popular episode by a large margin was the episode i did with keenan and that was because that was a completely real conversation between two friends and that was inviting you all in on that and with this episode I'm inviting you all into exactly the psyche of not Tommy Tom but Thomas Warren Prang you know I joked yesterday at the open mic the reason I don't use my last name uh, for stand-up uh, besides the fact that for whatever reason, uh, people in New York can't pronounce Prang, <laughs> but it's that I'm pretty sure I've disappointed my parents enough that, uh, I'd rather not do it again, you know, <laughs> but it's very enlightening, um, talking to my friends down here and just being able to take a deep breath and not worry about any judgment. All right, but we'll be right back after this. Hey guys, welcome back to Crying with Tom. <laughs> I'm sorry, I mean, uh, welcome back to Tommy Tom and One Mike. I'm glad you guys, uh, if you stuck with me so far, I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> like I said, this is going to be a more serious episode, and in this part, I have to address some things, um, just to kind of let you, the audience, and the people at home understand why um, I do the things I do, and I sometimes come across as um, a cold-hearted dick, let's be honest, you know? I am well aware that sometimes I don't come across or seem like the nicest person. No, anybody that's worked with me knows I just talk shit the entire night. It's not out of malicious thing. It's just me having so much shit that I just don't know how to address and deal with it sometimes. Which I think, if we're on it, all of us do at some point in time. And I guess the the first thing I should address is that is I guess why I don't. Um, confront people right away or talk about shit. Um, 
and I guess the best example I can give of this, and it's just kind of a little heavy, is uh, I, I had this guy that I was uh, real cool with. You know, I had a lot of respect for him. Uh, I considered him a friend and all that. Um, he's black, and, you know, growing up in our white town, there wasn't many, you know? But the problem with this guy is that every time he would drink or do something, he became this, as I, I think I joke, as like a Malcolm X. They always just had to talk about race issues and stuff like that, which is fine. But there was one day he crossed the line, and that's because he decided that he was going to talk shit about Keenan. And the reason he talked shit about Keenan is because Keenan's a black man married to a white woman. And he thought that was an issue and that he had to have a talk with Keenan about it. And the second he said that to me, there was a switch in my head. Because if there's one thing you got to know is that if you're my friend, if I love and care about you, anybody who harms you or talks ill of you is forever on my shit list. And you know, I didn't say anything right away at that point, but then maybe a few days later, then he went after me, telling me that I didn't know what the struggle was. And that's when I snapped. And I told him, I told him straight up to go fuck himself because I know the struggle better than he does because I'm that person, as I stated, who has never been accepted from either side. And yet, me defending myself in that moment, I had friends there who acted like I was the one out of turn and that I made it over dramatic and everything and what that just told me is that no one wanted to hear my voice and I didn't talk and guess what <laughs> I just fell into a deeper depression of alcohol and drugs and just went further into that pit of just wanting it to all be over And that's how a lot of my friends back home make me feel. And you know, I say a lot of my friends, but if I'm upfront and honest right now, which I said I would be, it's really only one group. You know, people I considered family, knowing that if I try and have a real conversation with them, I can't and there's really only one of them that I can and that's the one I hold the deepest um, regret about hmm I'm trying to think how I should go into this I guess I should just kind of rip the band-aid off um, Back when I was in my senior year of high school, um, at the time, one of my favorite memories was going to see Little Miss Sunshine with one of my best friends. Um, it would all, it all kind of led to this incident, or contributed to this incident. I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm still trying to censor myself, I guess, just because it's, it's tough to talk about. Um, me and my friend, we had planned to go to this movie and it was just this creepy moment looking back of these three friends just hanging around his sister and his friend and her friend. I told him to leave and whatnot and I didn't think anything of it. And I was like, all right, we'll just go. And we left. A few months later, um, Keenan and me are hanging out with them. Um, 
there was a fight and it came out exactly what those three friends did and uh, probably the only person the last 15 years I could really talk about it with was Keenan because I knew he felt the same way I did. But to be honest, the only thing I could latch on to in my head was that I was the one that pushed that we should just go. And knowing what happened, <laughs> I've never really forgiven myself for my part in that. And I guess going back to uh, that feeling of no one wants to hear me talk or express things. Um, <laughs> it would only took like a month after everything came out and everyone treated it as if it was nothing. You know, I would go over there and there's one of those pieces of shit sitting right there on the couch. And I didn't know how to feel or what to do, but I could see the damage that it did. But I was a coward, <laughs> just like everybody else in those small towns when you just move on, right? You just move on. Well, you fast forward, one of the guys, I guess really the main culprit, hurt somebody else that I really care about. And I'd always played nice with people because admittedly that incident with the guy in Keenan did turn me off and realize um, if I did speak up, I'd probably just make things worse and just be made out to be the villain and all that. But as I saw the outs pouring of support for this person for what had happened the only thing I can think about is where was this support 15 years ago so when I found out what had happened the first thing I did was reach out and apologize to someone I truly love and care about for not stepping up for them all those years ago because I knew nobody else did and I can't imagine what that made them feel or think for all those years and I have so much respect for the amazing person that they have grown and become and what the others don't realize is that this is why I don't want to hang out <laughs> with them because these people who have done this, these evil things are still a part of their lives. They still hang out. I mean, look, fuck it, let's, let's be real here. Um, I went to my friend's kid's birthday party. And as I stood there, you know, um, I definitely had to take a bunch of shots from him and his his girl about me not coming over and isolating myself and shit like that <laughs> only to first see uh, the guy who talked shit about Keenan and his wife then to see the other two assholes that were part of that incident 15 years ago then to hear that they also invited a guy that only a few months ago was threatening to fight me for making a comment on a girl's Facebook post. And the entire time they're talking shit, I just want to be like, do you guys fucking understand why I don't want to be here? They're only focused on what makes them feel good and don't realize how shitty the whole thing makes me. And maybe 
that makes me selfish. You know? But I can't put myself in those situations anymore because I'm not a fucking I'm not a fucking teenager, 20 year old anymore. I'm 33. You know? Uh, I'm trying to better my life and be a better person and I can't pretend I'm okay with the small town bullshit anymore where everyone pretends that they're friends and shit when most of them don't give a shit about each other they're drug and drinking buddies they're, they've just known each other for so long that they just stick with it and they don't know what else to do I can't pretend and play the game anymore and like I said I'm, I'm tired of being the villain in the story but if I gotta be the villain in their story fine because what I've realized is that the people that really care about me and really love me know the truth and know I don't mean any wrongs or harm towards people. I just can't sit around and watch or see something I know is inherently wrong and neglects how somebody else feels. It can't be fake <laughs> because it was reflecting in my stand-up and in this podcast because I would hold back because I was scared. But here's the thing. 90% of the people I'm probably talking about right now will never hear this podcast. <laughs> Yet those are the people I'm trying to appease and be nice for. And when I realize the extent of that is I won't say your name, I won't be direct with it, but I need to let out that I don't agree with everything. I don't like everything. And if you don't agree with me on those things, then that's on you. It's not on me. I don't take certain things lightly. You know, I went through rehab and therapy talking about these things, and there's still amends I've got to make with people. And there's people I've made amends with, um, admitting my faults. Um, still haven't admit theirs and maybe in my 20s I would take that personally and have this kind of vendetta against them but not at this point they don't mean shit you know uh, let them do what they do you know I have not so much bigger dreams but I have I have things I gotta do um, for so long I probably not probably, I definitely wanted to bring all my friends and everyone along with me. You know, I had this path I wanted to go down and I wanted to bring everybody with me. But every time they stumbled, I'd have to go back to try and get them back on the path and shit like that. But here's, here is a harsh, harsh reality. I had to realize and who knows, maybe some of you need to realize. I wasn't bringing anybody in every, anywhere if I had to keep going backwards all the progress I was making because I didn't want to leave them behind. Selfish on both parts. On their end, making me feel I have to appease them and go and alternate my life for their sake. And it's selfish for me almost entitlement that I got to bring them along with me and what I had to realize was that all I can do is go along my path invite people along the way and if they come they come and if they don't all I can hope is I see you another time I can't keep chasing things because I'm afraid of being alone you know I love all the friends I've made in my life and a lot of them the relationships are not the same 
they falling off. And I take, I'll take majority of the blame for that. I will. I have no problem doing that. But at the same time, all I can hope is that they realize their part in it too. It's easy to put yourself in that victim card and do the woe is me, why is this happening to me? But at the same time, you know, we all gotta grow the fuck up. <laughs> realize, yo, I'm not perfect either. It's an equal street. You fucked up. I fucked up. Let's both just be better, you know? And that's what I'm trying to do. You know, um, coming to the city, I got to hang out with my boy Dave, and we talked about a lot of this stuff. Um, we did a lot of reflecting uh, also with my boy t -Vest. and I was just looking back at our 20s and how reckless and stupid we were <laughs> and it's like yeah I can't do that anymore I'm not I'm not that kid you know and I appreciate those relationships so much just because we're on the same page that maybe back home with other people I'm not as there are people still doing the same shit they did when we were in high school you know and I'll be fucking blunt here I don't want to smoke weed and watch TV or play video games I'm over it you know I want to do I want to do shit you know <laughs> I, I, I feel like I've wasted those first like almost 30 years of my life and I'm just now doing something and I want to keep that momentum up I don't want to go backward we all need to grow up you know we're, we're not kids this is real life I apologize once again for all those listening to this uh, <laughs> therapy session with Tommy Tom it's not just my friends it's family too you know I I remember having some deep resentment at one point because all we we would only hang out with my mom's side of the family for whatever reason. But I, I will no qualms of saying it. I've always felt an incredible love from my dad's side of the family and I've had serious regrets that I've even now, I'm not as close with them as I would love to be. How thankful I am for the love they always showed me. Sometimes my I would feel bad because it would I would feel like my my uncle Mike uh, would talk me up so much in front of his kids that maybe they felt some resentment towards me and all that. And getting those DWIs and fucking up my life and shit like that. And then maybe part of that was that I didn't like that pressure. And I didn't like being viewed as like some golden child. I wanted to be a failure. I wanted to take the easy way. And my mom's mom doesn't acknowledge me because I'm adopted. And I know the family down in Georgia, I love them and all, but I know there's a fundamental mental difference in which our ideologies and thoughts just do not match. So, you know, I don't do this to try and make myself look great. Um, because clearly I'm not. And once again, I apologize if this is not what you were expecting to listen to. If you made it this far, good, you know, gold star for you. <laughs> I felt like it was important to make people realize a little more of what's going on in my head and how I act and how I feel. Because I haven't been that open a lot in my life. And I'm 33, 
as I keep saying, it's time for me to do so, you know, because people, when they find out I do stand up, as I said, they, they expect me to tell jokes and shit like that because they don't know. There is a much deeper, somewhat darker side to me that the comedy, I use comedy for as a therapy, not a defense. If you want a real conversation, I'm down to have a real conversation. I can't fake it and be jokey all the time and shit. This is just who I am. But don't worry, this isn't going to be how all these shows are going to go. You know, like I also said, uh, this is just something uh, I had always intended to do, and it's just kind of the perfect storm of that. Here I am on this trip to New York City by myself, and just feeling revitalized, and just being in the best headspace I've been in quite some time. So, enjoy, don't worry. Uh, there will be better ones. But I figured before I take this break, I should probably just let y'all in on my headspace, uh, the things I'm grateful for, and the things I have regrets about. Maybe somebody out there, they need to hear this. But guys, and girls, thank you so much. Um, as always, if you've listened to this episode, congrats, you found the podcast. Please like, subscribe, or and if you want to actually talk to me, you can reach me at uh, the Tommy Tom P eighty eight on Instagram and Tommy Tom eighty eight on Twitter. Um, thank you so much for everyone listening, and I hope maybe something I said resonated with people certain people and maybe make you rethink some things that you're doing in life thank you everybody and i'll talk to y'all next time i'm dr jekyll and mr high flip personality you know it's i you never see my kind never seen a sliver or a slice i'm the butcher choice cuts no i'm nice you got beef i got waggle with a knife now i'm gonna be wrapping up bodies up at night like Ray Charles, y'all know I'm out of sight. Now I'm gonna be slaying this, cause you know I love the life. Early. Yo, you gotta read between the lines. I'm only gonna be moving when I'm read through all the signs. Johnny Mnemonic, I got an upgrade in mind. This is for the rebels and their revolutionary minds. Cybernetic linguistics, you know I'm on my mind. Prototype the new dimension, man, that shit is mine. Future is creation and creation is sublime. Make your own legend, only happens with time. Hey guys, it's Tommy here. Uh, Just wanted to thank you all and apologize for uh, having to endure this uh, most recent episode. I know it was a heavy one, uh, dark at times, but uh, overall, it was just a real episode that I had to do. Uh, Admittedly, I was on this emotional high uh, in the city, uh, seeing all my friends and whatnot, so uh, I just felt like unloading a little which may be a little selfish, but hey, um, it's just something I thought I had to do. And I just wanted to thank everybody who has followed me through this first 20 episodes, season one of Tommy Tomlin Mike. And we will be back in August for season two, dropping every Thursday. Um, I'm excited about that. Um, If you enjoyed this first season, I can promise you that season two will be significantly better. and there will be much more fun, but there will also be much more realness and real talks on these episodes, as I have uh, quite a collective of guests lined up. So I hope you guys enjoy, and I'll catch you all in August. Peace. <laughs>